of vacuums reshaping the world. Why does a vacuum make a reflector glisten? What other industries utilize negative pressure? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. A vacuum coffee maker at work. Heat forces the water to the top, where it will brew with the ground coffee, then be pulled down to the bottom again through a filter that will leave the grounds behind. And that return to the bottom is accomplished simply by removing the unit from the heat. Cooling condenses the steam, creating a vacuum that quickly does the job. One of the many ways vacuums work for us every day. Another familiar application is the household vacuum carpet sweeper. But not so familiar are the ways in which industry makes wide use of the same principle. This plant, for example, vacuum cleans frequently to keep the tiny precision parts it makes for missiles free of even the tiniest dust specks, which could throw a whole rocket off course. And vacuum systems are used to protect workers, too. Before harmful dust can reach the safety mask, nearly all the stray contaminants raised by operations here are drawn into the hood and up through the pipes and hoses, again by vacuum. Now let's visit a plant that specializes in the production of industrial vacuum equipment. Not just cleaners and coffee makers, but a wide range of new devices that play key roles in the manufacture, processing, and packaging of scores of items. As a matter of fact, had it not been for industry's heavy investment in research that led to the development of high vacuum equipment, we would not have radio, television, and radar. Without it, commercial low-cost production of antibiotics would be impossible, and the atom could not have been split. Here are some of the big vacuum machines used in the atomic energy program. Throughout the paper industry, vacuums are used in the handling of pulp. Water was added to this batch of wood pulp so it could be pumped from a tank ship. The water is removed by a vacuum that pulls it to the inside of wire mesh drums. The dried pulp now can be peeled off and stored until needed. Ready for use, the pulp, after bleaching, is reliquified in order to facilitate the manufacturing process. Nearly 99% water at this point, the mixture runs onto the endless wire mesh screen of a paper machine. Here, agitation lines up the fibers, while suction, a low vacuum, pulls the water out again, draining it off through the screen. Then, after passing on through heavy heated rollers, the result is paper. These machines mold paper plates, and they too make use of vacuum. As the mold dips into a bath of pulp, the material is attracted by vacuum, then transferred by air to another form above, where heat dries the newly shaped plates. From dyes that dry each one thoroughly, the plates move on to automatic counting and packaging stations, products of a battery of vacuum molders capable of producing a million plates in 24 hours. New uses for high vacuum are a large part of this Philadelphia firm's business, for the company makes such things as freeze-drying equipment designed for the preservation of a long list of products ranging from serums and human tissue to fruit juice and meat. The material to be processed is locked inside where it is frozen in minutes, then subjected to very high vacuum for a number of hours to draw out all moisture. Dehydrating at low temperature prevents deterioration and permits indefinite storage without further refrigeration. It takes three freeze-dried shrimps to equal the weight of one fresh shrimp 
but flavor, texture, and food value are fully preserved regardless of how long the products are stored. Brief soaking will restore normal weight and texture. A much simpler kind of vacuum process has been in use for some time in plants where dairy and other food products are dehydrated and powdered. Such processes help consumer, food industry, and farmer alike, making possible the long, safe storage of agricultural products that otherwise would have to be consumed immediately or go to waste. Packaging, in this case bottling, also makes good use of vacuum, especially when the product involved happens to be naturally slow-moving, like oils of various kinds. By creating a vacuum in each bottle just before the oil flows in, an additional purification is accomplished while simultaneously speeding the flow of the liquid. This is a sheet of plastic being inserted in a machine that will transform it into a wall covering that looks exactly like a section of brickwork. First, an airtight seal is secured around the edges. Next, lamps are turned on for heat, and then vacuum is created. Here it is again, the same principle industry finds useful in so many ways, doing still another job. The vacuum has forced the plastic to conform to the mold exactly, creating a material that can be applied easily to various wall surfaces. Plastic relief maps can be mass produced in much the same way, simply by changing the mold. As soon as the vacuum is created, the plastic will assume the desired shape, reproducing in seconds all the details of an original that took hours, even days, to create. One more way in which industry uses vacuum to produce at low cost items that otherwise would be costly or even impossible to make. We take for granted the wide availability of inexpensive vacuum bottles like those being manufactured here. But such bottles were unattainable until industry learned how to evacuate and seal off the space between the glass walls and keep beverages hot or cold. Edison had to produce a vacuum in his first light bulbs to get them to work efficiently. And a vacuum is essential also to the working of the X-ray tubes being manufactured here, just as it's essential to the operation of your television tube. It's only in a high vacuum that speeding electrons can produce a visible image on a luminescent surface. Yes, vacuum helps us in many ways, by helping coat reflectors with a thin film of metal, to name just one more example. This coating consists of aluminum. After the metal is vaporized by heat, Tiny particles of it zip through a vacuum to attach themselves to whatever lies in their path. In this case, the objects are camera lenses. The coating, a metallic salt. Only a millionth of an inch thick, the coating materially improves the speed and quality of the lens. Not only optical equipment, but many other products too can be coated by the vacuum process. Even paper may be coated metallically in a vacuum with the help of equipment like this, developed by Stokes engineers. In the process, a roll of paper of any size is placed within a vacuum chamber. Next, the chamber will be evacuated of air, a vacuum created, after which the paper will be drawn over a source of vaporizing metal. As of now, many problems remain to be solved for one thing, it's difficult to keep the operation going continuously without letting the vacuum draw too much moisture out of the paper itself. And there are other difficulties, but they're being solved and rapidly by engineers who know that the rewards will be great for industry and consumer alike. For metallized paper like this, 
should cost only about half as much as metal foils, though providing most of the same advantages. Meanwhile, the advantage of manufacturing within a vacuum to ensure purity is well established. This germanium crystal will be used for transistors. And this plant employs a vacuum process to produce an especially pure alloy of steel. A slow motion camera looks inside the furnace to show what happens when the ingot itself is made to conduct a tremendous current of electricity, causing the massive piece of steel to melt. All the while, the melting metal is dripping down through a vacuum so that impurities are drawn off along with gases. The result being a new ingot of much tougher, cleaner steel formed in a mold below. The steel we see here is called a honeycomb. It's often sandwiched between outer sheets of metal so as to save weight without loss of strength in high-speed planes and missiles. Fastening the sandwich together securely, however, is quite a problem. And that's why Stokes designed this special vacuum furnace. A steel cover sheet placed over the sandwich will seal it off in the lower part of the furnace, thus affecting a vacuum in which brazing can be accomplished at 1,700 degrees, a temperature that in normal atmosphere would ruin the metal through oxidation. Until this furnace was developed, it was necessary to build special vacuum or gas-filled envelopes around each sandwich. Now in production, larger models of this prototype handle panels up to 50 square feet. How strong is a honeycomb sandwich? Here's one way to answer the question. And now another question. How can we help our economy and our industries to keep out front in science as we move further into the space age? Vacuum chambers like this, which can simulate altitudes in excess of one million feet for testing spacesuits, cost enormous sums for research and development. Industry's ability to devote the money required depends largely on how much profit is left over after all bills and taxes are paid. We can help our industries make faster progress toward more abundance and security for all the American people by understanding the role that profits play in our economic development and by insisting that the taxes imposed by government do not hamper progress. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. Wide Yard, get involved with kitchen appliances. What does a lawn furniture company make in the winter? How does industry contend with seasonal slumps? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. The fishing industry, outstanding example of the many industries long subject to seasonal ups and downs. Today, those peaks and valleys are being smooth, benefiting consumer, fishermen, and the many others involved. This is a report on how it's being done, on the ways in which this industry and others have helped the entire economy by stabilizing production and employment. Many of the fishing industry's problems were solved by the development of the easy-to-store, easy-to-cook, easy-to-eat, frozen fish sticks. Prepared whenever the fish are caught, they can be sold anytime. And by making fish attractive to more people, they have actually expanded the market for fish several times. The fish sticks are breaded automatically on the way to pre-cookers for thawing. As they emerge from the pre-cooker, the trays are placed in a frying rack. Here again, automatic controls take over to ensure just the right degree of cooking. 
a long period for Easterners, not so long for Westerners, who go for a much lighter color. Regional preferences are important in these days when a local catch can no longer be restricted to its own neighborhood. After cooking, the fish sticks are weighed and packaged. This woman used to count on only a few months' work a year. Now, her employment depends on demand for the product rather than the season. What comes after wrapping? The freezer once again to lock in freshness all the way to the dinner table, regardless of the month. In candy plants, some months, the hot ones, used to mean a virtual shutdown. But industry's ability to control temperatures has eliminated the production gap in this field, too. Now, air conditioning keeps the candy factories going the year round to fill orders from air conditioned stores which can sell chocolate the year round. Another important means of stabilizing production is employed here in California by Basic Vegetable Products Incorporated. The chief product is onions, and the company contracts with farmers from the Mexican border all the way north to Oregon to ensure a year-round supply, early crops as well as late ones. This keeps personnel and equipment busy all year. The dehydration process that's the specialty here contributes to stable production too by letting us enjoy the product any time at all. Even Christmas trees are no longer seasonal, at least not in the cutting and processing. Activity is underway seven months a year at the Duluth, Minnesota plant of Halverson Trees Incorporated. For here, they've learned how to process and store the trees so that those to be used for Christmas can be cut as early as the January before. A waxy liquid is an important part of the treatment that makes this possible, delaying the drying out process. Because the northern spruce is naturally brownish, the undercoat is followed by a coat of color, silver, white, blue, or green, that maintains an attractive appearance throughout the holidays. Quite an improvement on Mother Nature. Finally, on a merry-go-round, the trunks are doweled and sealed into hollow metal stands. The stands are designed not only to make Dad's work easier when it's time to decorate the tree, but also to hold an artificial sap. The sap, plus cold storage, will keep the trees fresh for a long, long time. But work doesn't stop with processing. Simultaneously, new trees are planted on the company's experimental farm, part of a program to conserve our forests and ensure a perpetual supply for a business no longer seasonal. For factories supplying photographic products, summertime formerly brought the peak demand since that was the only season that provided enough light for the average amateur shutterbug. Then industry learned how to make faster, more sensitive film, recording a better image in less time with much less light. With the film came improved lenses, low-cost flash bulbs, and an end to the old restrictions. By stretching the usefulness of its products over longer periods, the industry also increased and stretched its business. Now the factories, like the snap shooters, are busy 52 weeks a year. As in so many other industries, the ups and downs of shipbuilding often are extreme, not for seasonal reasons, but simply because demand is erratic. Ships like this big 600-foot self-unloading freighter simply aren't ordered every day. But for the men who built it, the business of living goes on all year long. So the problem, quite simply, was keeping equipment and workers busy between orders for ships.
launching of a new vessel no longer means the end of many jobs here at the Manitowoc Shipbuilding Corporation in Wisconsin, for the firm now makes other products too. Things like cranes, drag lines, and power shovels. It was partly to provide year-round employment that the company decided some years ago to diversify, moving first into heavy construction machinery, since its manufacture involved equipment and skills already at hand. But the process didn't stop there. Soon the expanding field of refrigeration beckoned, and the firm moved into the making of home freezers and refrigerated display cases, any number of items that have little or nothing to do with ships and yet are the logical products of a shipbuilding organization. Logical in that they had the plant, the tools, the skilled manpower, and the determination to reduce between ship unemployment. <music> Diversification has been good for the men who work here, and it's good for the rest of us too. For it not only stabilizes employment to the benefit of the whole economy, it also helps produce goods which, under the pressure of increased competition, must give us better products and services, and more of them, for less money than ever before. Among countless examples of industrial diversification, one that was worked out here in Louisville by the Logan Company serves as a crystal clear illustration of the principle. A manufacturer of factory conveyor systems, ornamental iron, mattresses, and wire products, the firm put summer furniture into production as a sideline to offset slack periods. Summer furniture is made during the winter, so what happens if slack periods come in the summer? That's easy. They switch to fireplace equipment, sold and used during cold months, but manufactured during hot ones. The woman we find forming a part for a wood holder or the one who rivets on the handle might be busy six months from now working on metal furniture or conveyors. Steady work and steady income for the workers and their employer. Stability of jobs and production doesn't just happen. Careful planning is required, a lot of it, and a long time in advance. Here in Dayton, Ohio, at Harris Seabold Company, which makes printing presses, the big planning board shows each stage of every order on any given date. Schedules are worked out two years ahead, based on careful estimates of sales and resultant demands on skills, equipment, and raw materials. To meet the production schedule, the chief engineer and the plant superintendent consider what will be needed in the way of machinery and decide where to put it. In making these decisions, they use a 10 by 12 foot floor plan of the factory with pieces of colored tape representing every piece of equipment in the plant. Thus, the new machine can be rolled into place with a minimum of interruption to work in progress. Costly stop and go are eliminated. Customers are assured on time delivery of well-made products. Production and employment are kept on an even keel by extensive planning ahead. A busy 12 years of planning and research went into the production stabilizing development we're about to see in operation here at m &R Dietetic Laboratories in Sturgis, Michigan. The dehydration of milk was among the early methods used by the dairy industry to solve storage and shipping problems. And now the experts have gone a step further, giving us dehydrated cream. After the liquid cream has been separated from the milk, it's put through machines which remove most of the moisture, then sprayed through nozzles into huge drying chambers, which complete the job of transforming the cream into powder. You might wonder why they go to all this trouble. The answer is that there's a big new market for cream in this form, thanks largely to its economy and convenience. Result? New business, new jobs, jobs that are steady, because the product's lasting qualities eliminate many of the up and down supply and demand problems encountered with fresh perishables. A 
Another dairy product that's come a long way is ice cream. Being shaped into bars by this complicated device at Borden's plant in Columbus, Ohio. Once produced laboriously, a little at a time, only on special occasions, ice cream now is abundant throughout the year, with production no longer sporadic. Since the nation's cows go on producing milk without regard for the peaks and valleys of consumption, the industry has had to devise new products, storage, and shipping methods to make the most efficient use of our abundant milk supplies. For the ice cream, it took frozen storage facilities. Also important, new marketing methods, like the vending machine that makes milk available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Another of the countless examples of the ways in which we all benefit from industry's success in smoothing out and steadying the once abrupt swings of supply and demand, making for a good life for more people all year long. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade. A service of the National Association of Manufacturers.